Chris Avalon unfiltered, bitch. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered. Happy, happy Wednesday. Today, when it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I forgot what day it was, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, welcome to a brand new episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered, a show where we get into all the latest celebrity news, gossip, entertainment news, anything that's trending all over social media. We talk about it on this here show. So before we get started on this, the upcoming um, hot topics, could you please do me a solid and hit that like button, that subscribe button, and that notification button, so that way you know when we go live with a brand new episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered. So thank you all who immediately have been tuning into the live stream and those of you who are going to tune in later on to the playback of the episode. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in and showing your support uh, to this here little old show that I built. And we're going to get into some tea on Celine Dion. We're going to talk about Jaleel White from, you know, Family Matters is going to be weighing in on the whole Quiet On Set docuseries. We're going to talk about one of the gayest North American shows that's about to come this year, and I'm excited about it. We're going to talk about Todrick Holes being dragged on social media for liking a anti-Taylor Swift post. We're also going to talk about speaking to Taylor Swift. Apparently, Paris Hilton was kicked out of uh, VIP to make way for Taylor and Travis at Coachella. So we're going to talk about that. Plus, the backlash towards Jared McCormack continues after he went and continued to stick his foot in his mouth while appearing on The Breakfast Club to explain that whole race play joke that wasn't funny to begin with. And then the more he explained it, the more stupid he started to sound. So we're going to talk about that. Plus, Kelly Clarkson is going in and letting have on her ex-husband, Brandon Blackstock. There's a lot of money issues that's going on with them. Plus, Wendy Williams is dealing with some, speaking of marital issues and money and things of that nature, Wendy Williams' ex-husband, Kevin Hunter, is being sued by the uh, conservator over some money that he wound up getting. He was overpaid, and she said she want her money back or Wendy's money back. But apparently the conservator's a part of it. She's going to be dealing with it. Plus, there's rumors circulating that Hallie Bailey and DDG have called it quits, even though they have a child together. And we have some drag race news that we're going to be getting into. Apparently, um, it's been revealed when or revealed when we will be getting the official cast of All Stars 9, when that's going to be coming out, because, you know, this week is the finale for all, I mean, for season 16, so we're going to get into that. Plus, Kennedy Davenport is opening up about her rumored beef with Trixie Mattel from, you know, the All-Stars 3 season, which I'm I actually bringing this up because I'm currently re-watching that season, so I thought this would be good to talk about. Plus, all the other, you know, if anything else happens to come up that I may have missed about the show, if there's any breaking news, definitely let me know down in the comments and we'll talk about it as well as other off-topic, com- you know, topics that I may not have added to the docket because we do that on this live stream. But anyway, before we get started, let me hit my banner. And yeah, just see we have a couple of people in the building. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Um, <laughs> and now, <clears throat> without further ado, hold on, let me get a swig of water because I'm like, why am I? Doing a little clearation of the throat. All right. So now let's get into our first topic. And it looks like one of the gayest North America arena tours is coming to a city near you because the ultimate pop team up is coming in scorching hot. And I have to say that I'm excited about this tour that's coming because it was announced yesterday that Troy Savon and Charlie XCX are heading out on tour together. So it says that they're promising to turn iconic venues into raves with, on their newly announced sweat tour, which includes a stop at New York City's Madison Square Garden. And that's why I'm excited, because they're going to be at my job, chair. Yeah. So the pop innovators who have collaborated on songs 1999 and 2099 will co-headline with Shy Girl opening for all dates. According to a press release, the tour is not only a celebration of their individual successes, but it's also a testament to their commitment to inclusivity, inclus- inclusivity, sorry, it was like in- inclusivity. I'm like, what, what kind of word is that? But anyway... It's also a testament to their commitment to inclusivity and diversity within the music industry. Now, fans can expect an electrifying show filled with exhilarating performances, stunning visuals, and infectious beats. 
though a new collaborative uh, collaboration, sorry, between the two artists have not yet been announced, but I have a strange feeling that will probably happen. And if it's not, then y'all need to get on it. So that way, for the sake of the show, y'all could do 1999, 2099, and a new kind of 99. <laughs> or just a brand new song. Where it's like, y'all gotta have three songs with y'all up there collaborating, you know, doing together since y'all co-headlining. Now, um, the 21 City Tour presented by Live Nation will kick off September 14th in Little C at Little Caesars Arena in Detroit, Michigan, and finish on October 23rd in Seattle, Washington at the Climate Pledge Arena. It marks both XCX and Savon's biggest venues to date. Well, they have enough, and I feel like they have enough songs between them that they could actually afford to sell out arenas. And with all the gays that live in New York and all these little these little children out here, I'm sure the same ones that was at that Olivia Rodrigo concert will be going to this Charlie XCX Troy Savon tour that's coming up. And I'm excited for it. So it also says that her sixth studio album, Brat, is due out on June 7th. And she also recently revealed the UK Arena Tour, Savon's 2023 record, Something to Give Each Other, was critically acclaimed with his lead single, Rush, earning two Grammy nominations. Now, tickets for the Sweat Tour go on pre-sale April 25th at 10 a.m. local time. General tickets will be available on April 26th at 10 a.m. local time. Advanced pre-sale registration is available now at sweat. I mean sweat um, tour .com. So, um, if y'all are interested in going to this tour or whatever, um, definitely head over to. I did post a link at um, chrisavalon.com. So, if you guys want to actually you know get tickets and stuff for this i think definitely think this would be a great tour to go see there's been like to be honest i feel like there's a lot of tours coming out and i know a lot of people are being real picky in regards to like a lot of the tours that they want to be a part of i'm still upset that okay two of the tours that i would really love to have come to madison square garden got sent over to brooklyn to the barclays center i wanted to go to the i want to see i wanted the um the missy elliott tour that she's got with Busta Rhymes and Sierra, who I saw Sierra recently was doing an interview saying that she's trying to lose all this baby weight for this tournament. I'm like, girl, you're going to be able to snap back real quick. First of all, I'm digging, and you need to um, have um, your husband get a bad segment. Like, mm -mm. First of all, we either using condoms, birth control, or you getting a bad segment because y'all got enough kids between y'all, and I got to, mama got to get out here and make this money, even though you know he is a well renowned football player. And so that tour I'm excited for and I want to see, but I'm mad because Brooklyn got it and we didn't get it over at MSG. And then the other tour that I wanted was the Shakira tour, where she's going to be over there doing her tour at the Barclays Center. So I'm glad we got this one because this one's going to be lit. And as someone who is a fan of Charlie XEX and Troy Savon, I like their music. And Shy Girl, I actually like her stuff too. Um, I like, and it, I love the fact that I think because the three of them have kind of come up within this whole, I mean, well, more or less Charlie XEX and Shy Girl, their music falls within the spectrum of hyper pop. Troy Savon has dabbled in hyper pop, but his music was more laid back. So I'm hoping, like, with this tour, he's going to have the up uh, the the bdms um bpms bpms not bdms <laughs> the bpms beats per minute on this one like you have to i feel like he need to remix a couple of those songs add a little yang yang a little you know a little beat behind some and stuff because i feel like a lot of troy savon's music is a little laid back and you don't want to have those moments where it's just like full-on like a laid back show especially when you got shy girls music is very much up tempo and fun and party rave type stuff and charlie xcx's music goes into that too more or less with you know the upcoming album brat but also she's got a lot of these previous songs that she does that falls in that spectrum as well and then she can do a little remix so i feel like troy you want to uh, step your pussy up when it comes to the stuff now i feel like what would have made this would have added a little bit more icing on the cake is if they would have incorporated kim petras now if it was kim petras troy Savon, charlie xcx and shy girl bitch i'd have been falling all the way out because this would be taking me back to my rave days i miss those days where i used to go to like those warehouse parties and just be lit partying doing my e-pills and my water <laughs> and just stay out till like six in the morning and then after that go to the after parties oh my god those were the days i missed the um, the 2000s and yeah, I miss like the the 2000s stuff when I was getting up in them clubs and I was illegally getting up in the clubs in the 90s because I was underage and there's like you knew people who knew people. So 
I miss that. I'm excited. Like, as I said before, I'm excited for this tour. Shell. I, what, somebody, I think Robin did tell me that I need to take the day off because that place is going to be full of bottoms. I just hope that, well, I don't know if they'll be able to, to slip it in because, you know, they got metal detectors. But if there's some boys up in here that uh bring their poppers and they want to slide up in the men's room in the stall. Wait, let me not say that because what if somebody from my job is watching? <laughs> but anyway, no, I'm going be, I'm, I'm to be well behaved. Cause it'd probably be, you know, I'd probably be finding me some trade up there that night. But anyway, so good luck to y'all. I'm excited for this tour and this show. I hope is well. I feel like it's gonna be lit, so I'm excited. Okay, so um, it said, like, "Watch you cry with Charlie honoring Sophie, and you know she's gonna give Sophie her flowers and help change her." Well, yeah, because I have to say, like, I loved Sophie's production style. I loved her beats. Sophie is someone who is very much well missed in the music business. And it's unfortunate what happened to her. For those who don't know what happened, she accidentally, what she did was she died. I think, I can't remember when, a couple of years ago. She was, I think, trying to climb up on top of, like she had like this balcony area, I believe it was at a hotel. She was trying to climb up to get a better look at the moon is from what they were saying. And then she slipped and fell, which I'm like, mm -mm. when it come to heights, I don't fuck with that. Anything that's got to be that's gonna possibly put myself in danger. I don't know if she was under the influence, or whatever, or just being a daredevil. But mm -mm, when it comes to stuff like that, I don't be playing with my life. Not like that. But she is someone who is definitely messed with the music it's because she was just so unique in regards of like her production value and her production style and all that good stuff. Okay, so now let's move on to the next topic and let's talk about Celine Dion, who has a documentary coming out. And I had no idea about this until I saw the story this morning. So they said on Tuesday, August, uh, April 16th, that my heart will go on Hitmaker shared on Instagram a photo from I am Celine Dion in addition to unveiling its premiere date. Because I was like, I was shocked at it. I was like, wait a minute, Celine Dion got a um, a documentary coming out, which, child, you best believe me, me being a, a big Celine fan, I will most certainly be giving this my divided attention or undivided attention. I forgot to like it. So I said, let me like that real quick. But anyway, so uh, according to people that said the film, which examines Dion's legendary career and recent diagnosis with the rare autoimmune neurological disorder, stiff person syndrome will debut on streaming globally on Tuesday, June 25th. In addition to announcing the release date for the upcoming documentary directed by Irene Taylor, a first look image of I am Celine Dion was also revealed. The shot is a recent image from the My Heart Will Go On singer, 56, taken from her side profile with her hair pulled back. Dion appears to be in high spirits in the photo as she's in the midst of holding up a empowered fist. The Grammy winner posed, uh, posted the preview image on her Instagram and teased the release date as well as the film's official synopsis in the caption. Um, a handful of fans of the comments show how much they're looking forward to the documentary. So, um, and it's written in French, the way that she wrote it. So, um, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to it. So, so some people said, OMG Mother is coming, one follower replied, while another said, I can't wait to see this. We love you, Celine. Fellow hitmaker Cindy Lauper also commented, many, many blessings. Love you, Celine. I am Celine Dion is described in the official synopsis as a love letter to fans and a raw and honest behind the scenes look at the iconic superstar's struggle with a life altering illness. The film also highlights the music that has guided her life while also showcasing the resilience of the human spirit. Uh, so, as I said before, I'm excited. Um, you know, she's been making a lot of appearances. She appeared at a couple of hockey league games. She appeared at the um, Oscars, and I mean, the uh, not the Oscars, the Grammys in February, where, you know, people dragged uh, Miss Taylor Swift for her overall, how she just was, oh my God, I'm so glad, I'm, I'm so glad to win another award I knew I was going to win and just snatched it from Celine and people was like, oh no, bitch, what you're not gonna do is is disrespect that icon. You wanna be where she is, where you're well respected and all this stuff. I feel like Taylor has her little fan base that she's respected by, and she's respected by um, you know, those people that continue to give her awards and stuff, where she collects them like tchotchkes and shit and friends. But um Celine Dion is an icon, she's a legend, she is the moment, and she needed her respect, and they felt like 
she was being disrespectful, but in pure uh, Taylor Swift fashion, a team cleared that up real quick. It was like, no, she wasn't being rude, and they had to do that quick photo op. So with all that being said, I'm excited for this tour. I'm in tour. I'm excited for this documentary. And you know what? Celine Dion is someone who has been in the industry for over, for almost, what, I think about four decades, a little over three decades. So she needs her flowers. It's unfortunate, you know, with this autoimmune disease that she's going through. And, you know, hopefully they will find a cure and there'll be ways that she'll be get, you know, she'll get better and she'll get back out there and do what she loves, which is sing. Because she has, she is one of the, she is one of the most iconic voices in the industry. So shout out to you, Miss Celine. Okay, so we have a, a comment. Robert says she has an uncredited production credit on in Bitch on Madonna. So yes, Madonna is a part of the Vaporwave playlist. Oh, you're talking about Sophie. I was like, wait, who? Celine? Oh, yeah. So um, she did work with her. And I remember at one point, I remember hearing that um, Lady Gaga wanted to work with Sophie on the Chromatica album and some of the remixes and stuff. First of all, that remix, that remix album of Chromatica is god awful. I don't know how anybody could listen to that. I was like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, all the years I've been going to clubs and raves and all this other stuff. Um, you know, back in the days of when, you know, I may date myself, but whatever, uh, you know, when Fat Boy Slim and all of them was out here, do, you know, doing DJ sets and, and things of that nature, uh, which is like 20 some odd years ago, I was sitting there like, this is the best y'all can come up with when the production, mm -mm. them beats was bad. And I was like, I listened to that one, I was like, mm -mm, I couldn't, I couldn't even finish it. That's how bad it was. <laughs> but anyway, um, let's move on to our next topic. And talk about Family Matters star Jaleel White, who is weighing in on the Quiet On Set, The Dark Side of Kids TV docuseries that has been dominating our airwaves for the past month plus. And he weighed in because, you know, there's been a lot of celebrities that's been coming out weighing in on it. A lot of young, you know, child stars, whatever, because apparently social media wants every child star under the sun that were around in the 90s and the 2000s to weigh in on this situation. And... I love the fact that there are people that's coming out that's speaking out about it, but I don't. I also feel like the in, that you people on social media need to not be trying to force people to come out and speak out on things if they don't need to speak out on it, or if they they haven't experienced what they've experienced, or similar or had similar experiences, I should say. So Jaleel White, the actor best known for playing Steve Urkel on the 1990s sitcom Family Matters, spoke about his time as a child star after the docu-series featuring former show writers and child actors revealed a toxic workplace on Nickelodeon sets. Now, in the wake of Quiet on Set, the dark side of kids TV, former child stars have alleged that they faced abuse, prejudice, and a toxic workplace on TV sets, but Jaleel White isn't one of them. In an interview with Today, the former Family Matters star said that he felt secure while shooting the hit sitcom, saying, I always felt safe and protected on set. He said, I was lucky. Child actors are having a moment where some of the harsh realities of our business is coming to light, continued White, who starred as Steve Urkel on the Perfect Strangers spinoff for nine seasons. And I think a lot of people didn't know that, that um, Family Matters is a spinoff of Perfect Strangers, a show I used to actually grow up, I grew up loving too. Larry and Balky were like my favorite, especially Balky because, you know, he was um, an immigrant that came over and the craziness that ensued between them. And Joe Marie Payton was the elevator attendant. And then they went and spun, spun it off. That's what happened with a lot of shows. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of, of, of our favorite shows coming up back in the day were spinoffs and spinoffs and spinoffs and spinoffs. I can't tell you how many damn spinoffs came from I believe all in the family wasn't it like Maud and um, then they had the Jeffersons and all these other people like so many damn spinoffs came from those type of shows back in the day. And Maud was with B. Arthur before you know she did um, the Golden Girls. But anyway, so um, it also said that um, 
In Quiet on Set, former Nickelodeon stars detailed the abuse and hostile work environment they allegedly faced at the network during the tenure of producer Dan Schneider, who oversaw series like All That, The Amanda Show, and Drake and Josh. The doc saw Drake Bell come forward about the repeated S.A. he survived from dialogue coach Brian Peck and actors that G like Giovanni Samuels and Brian Hearn discussed the racism they allegedly endured on All That. White said that his mother, who also served as his manager, kept him safe as he navigated Hollywood as a young star, saying, quote, she wasn't perfect, but she did enough to protect me from some of the obvious trappings in the business. For one thing, she was a helicopter mom. She was all over my ass because the kids are left alone that are, sorry, that are left alone are the ones that the predators tend to seek out, which corroborates Drake Bell's story because Drake Bell, remember, he said that when Brian Peck came at him and finally assaulted him, his father had a gut feeling that it was like, no, there's something not right with this guy. I don't want this guy around my son. Then people behind the scenes who were aware of Brian Peck's behavior, and this is what irritates me, that the people that's supposed to be in the business to protect you, like these agents and people that work behind the scenes, because all they worry about is they goddamn check is out here putting these kids in harm's way because they know it's like, oh no, it's you're saying that because you're homophobic and you're gay or whatever. And it's like, no. First of all, gays and us, we ain't no damn monolith. So you're not going to lump us in with that old nasty ass pervert over there. So that's what you're not going to do. Number two is the fact that, yeah, once that, you know, that, that Brian wants to start chirping in people's ear and all this other stuff that was going on and Drake's Drake ended up getting firing his father. His father was pushed out of the picture, and the mother, who ain't know what the fuck she was doing, and was being a bit of bitch towards the father because they had their situation. And a lot of times, when it comes to these splitations in relationships with the parents not getting along, a lot of y'all like to use y'all kids as weapons, shields, and pawns to justify your hatred for the man that you decide to lay down and spread your legs with, and vice versa. So a lot of y'all parents do that instead of thinking about putting the child before your idiosyncrasies please hold i'm like is my i just realized i'm like is my um my laptop plugged in it don't look like it is but whatever i don't think the battery's gonna die we're gonna be good <laughs> i was like wait a minute i don't think i plugged in my my um my computer but anyway we're gonna we're gonna pipe um continue to go through the show but anyway so and then the minute that he was able to get the father away then, and the mother came in the picture is when he did what he did to Drake. So, one of the things I love about Jaleel is that, you know what, even though that wasn't his situation, he said, no, my mother was a helicopter mom. She stayed up on my ass the whole time, and she wasn't allowing those people to do what they did to me. I mean, to do what, to me what they did to other people. And that's what it is. It's like, you know what, mm -mm. at the end of the day, my child, and if you're going to deny him jobs or whatever the case is, then so be it. But, but I guess the good thing about Jaleel was that Jaleel was in a good position of power because let's talk about it. And I know Joe Marie's probably still salty about it to this day, but girls, sometimes this is just the way the business is. Um, Cause I remember she wound up talking about how she was mad because the show initially started out as one thing. And then Steve Urkel comes in one day and then it all of a sudden becomes the Steve Urkel show. And it's like, but wait a minute. Cause first of all, I, and I remember this clearly because at one point it wasn't that long ago, I think maybe like a year or two ago, I was rewatching all episodes of family matters, no shade, but the show wasn't funny until y'all brought Jaleel white on. It wasn't. And I feel like y'all were going to be facing cancellation if y'all couldn't find a way to get kids to come in and watch the show. Because uh, bes besides Steve Urkel being in there doing, did I do that? And oops. And and then the, uh, also playing Stefan Urkel, Myrtle Urkel, and all that other stuff. So besides playing these other characters that they brought in to spice up the show, I don't feel like people would have watched the show because it was just a bunch of, it was just a regular Black family in the suburbs. And to me, it's like, yeah, that's cool to show that because of the Cosby show and all that and that sort of thing. But the jokes just weren't there. And at the end of the day, ABC, with their whole TGIF lineup, it was about the money. And it was about trying to get those kids to come in and watch this 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 show. Hence why we had like Boy Meets World and Full House and don't even and, and then also Step by Step, another show that was in a similar situation as Family Matters. Because step by step, that show wasn't that great either until y'all brought in Cody. 
And I still am mad to this day the way they did Sasha Mitchell with that whole lie about him beating his wife and all this stuff. And that hurt his career and that hurt him being on the show. But Sasha Mitchell with the whole, who was basically like the white version of Steve Urkel, except he was sort of like the airhead white kid. He saved that show too because he was funny. But step by step by itself with that whole concept, it wasn't a funny show. So shout out to you, Julia. I'm glad you spoke out as well as there are other people that I should point out that spoke out as well. Mar Paul Gosseler, who you know is from Say by the Bell, Ned Classifieds, Devin Workheiser, and Lisa Lisa, who was on that Taina show. First of all, I love me some Taina. That was my show back in the day. Whatever happened to Christina Vidal? But you know, Lisa Lisa played the mother. But anyway, so yeah, I just want to point that out and, and and shout out to you, like I said. And for those of you who want to continue to speak out and, and let your, let people know your experience, like, you know what? I sympathize with you. Same thing with uh, Kenan Thompson, I think, was the one that spoke out and said, you know what? Nothing, did, this did not happen to me when I was at all that, all that. But my heart goes out to those who have been traumatized and hurt by what went on over there with the, you know, with whoever had traumatic experiences. I stand with y'all. And so I, I love when, when people do that. It's like, you know what, even though it didn't happen to me, I'm gonna speak out on behalf and show my solidarity. Okay, so um, we have comments, please hold. Oh, thank you. He said, I love your nightmare shirt. She said, oh, my nightmare Elm Street, yeah. It's a cool shirt. I wish I could show y'all the whole thing because it's like in four little compartments. Got the glove and all the stuff on there. And yeah, Nightmare Elm Street is like one of my all-time favorite horror movies. And I am a horror movie fanatic. So I do subscribe to Shudder. And I do watch a lot of the horror movies that they have over on um, Tubi, even though the ads and stuff irritate my spirit. But I sit through it so that way I can watch a lot of the scary movies that I actually haven't seen in a minute that I want to see. So anyway, it says um, she settled for Madonna Sloppy Seconds with blood. Yeah, who worked with M first on Rebel Heart. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't really feel like her blood, the songs he did, she did with Blood Pot. Okay, they're okay, but they're not on a level of like memorable. So I went to my first rave in 1995. Do I remember when I went to my first rave? First of all, raves was lit. And I'm definitely curious to see what Charlie and Troy's version of a rave or idea of a rave is going to be when they do their tour. So I'm excited to see that. Um, I said, well, Corey Feldman was trying to warn me. He damn sure was. And one of the things that irritates me to this day, because I remember that clip was circulating not too long ago, is when he went on The View and was talking about it. And Barbara Walters trying to make it seem like he was crazy. No comment. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, so we're just going to move on. <laughs> it's like, look what happened to Jamie Foxworth. Um, she ended up being a drug addict. Not only that, but she did porn. So it kind of makes me wonder what happened to her that made her result. Or maybe she did talk about it, and I don't remember, because I know she did this in real life. She did a couple of reality shows on VH1. And you know what? Before OnlyFans became OnlyFans or whatever, I do have to applaud those a lot of those reality TV shows for taking celebrities who had a period in their life and they went off and they did porn because, you know, Hollywood likes to kind of thumb their nose at their porn. Although a lot of times at your little private parties, y'all do like to invite sex workers to your little private events to have them make a little coin and do unspeakable things for a check. And we got celebrities now trying to jump on the whole OnlyFans bandwagon. But I applaud like the VH1s and all that that brought on, you know, those has been celebrities to come on and be like, you know what, even though you kind of left the industry and you went off and did porn because you had to find a way to make money because she went upstairs and never came back down. <laughs> it was like, where's Judy? And then they gave her an opportunity to tell her side of the story. It's like, yeah, and we got the facts of life because of different strokes. Mm -hmm. It's like so many, you know, there was a lot of spinoffs and spinoffs and spinoffs and spinoffs that existed back in those days. I don't even think they do stuff like that no more. Now you just want to remake every damn thing. Like, they want to remake Good Times into an anime. Like, no, Good Times was what it was back in the day. I'm not watching an animated version of a show I used to love that I used to watch in reruns. Because I never was around. I wasn't alive. I don't. I don't think I was alive when the original series came out. I told you I'm two days older than Beyonce. 
<laughs> but anyway, it's like, yeah, Jaleel ended up being the real star of the show. Mm-hmm. And uh, watch the floor seats not exist. It's going to be a dance club. First of all, they don't need floor seats. Um, but I have a feeling there will be floor seats. I think what's going to happen is they're going to have floor seats and they're also going to have like a um like you could come up to the stage similar to olivia rodrigo had this as well she had they have floor seats that will push to the back but you also had a bunch of kids that could come up that were they were let in first where they could actually come up to the stage and they could actually stand in front of the stage and be like close to the actual stage so it's standing room so they'll probably have that where it's like you know if you want to have your little you, you know because here's what a lot of people don't know like the the um this how do I explain it? Like the floor seats are folding chairs because you know they those can't be there because when you have the Knicks and the Raiders games, you got to be able to move those chairs out because you know when the stage isn't there, that's what that is. It's like the rain the you have the the court for the basketball and you have the ice for the Rangers games. It's amazing to me how they we have a crew of people that could get that shit done so fast. It amazes me when I see how they how they do it. But anyway, so. Um, I'm thinking that's what that's probably going to be. I would love to see how their set design is going to look because I'm sure it's going to look pretty cool and it's going to be a lot of lights and stuff. I really hope there's not going to be any people there that are photosensitive. Although I remember when I did the Fall Out Boy concert, we did have someone who, a girl who was bound to a wheelchair and you know I tried to accommodate her as, as much as I could. And her mother was really appreciative that didn't like a lot of the pyro and stuff. And what irritated me is that there was no warning for us to even warn the people that that was going to happen. So I wish we would have been notified of that. They probably were notified in the email later on, which is why they told us the next time we had a show for someone else. But um, yeah, so there, so there was that. Is that um I know a lot of people get photos like sensitive to the lights and, and or you're prone to see that I always feel bad for people too that you know are prone to seizures because of the lights and all the other stuff, the flashing lights and stuff that goes on a concert. I'm like, damn, y'all can't even enjoy like a, a concert or, or something. So I was I always feel for those people who have neurological sensitivities that can't really enjoy like a cool concert or whatever. Um, so I really, so I feel like there will be floor, um, a floor, I feel like the floor seats will exist, but I feel like if they want that feeling of a rave, they're going to have us, they're going to have it where, you know, they, they can come up to the stage and like, there'll be standing room. Um, and I would hope that the upper levels would be stand that the kids will be standing up too <laughs> i don't think they'll be sitting or maybe they will but for the most part when i've been seeing a lot of concerts a lot of people stand up okay so now Cheryl, let's move on to this story and let's talk about todrick hall who can't seem to keep himself out of trouble so todrick is being called out by the swifties for liking a post where courtney love said <coughs> excuse me the anti-hero singer is not interesting however he later clarified that it was not meant as a diss to tay tay he said, to be clear, I'm in rehearsals for Burlesque in London and was scrolling through the internet and saw Taylor in a post, so I liked it. This is what Todrick39 wrote via his IG stories on Tuesday, April 16th, saying, I do not agree with Miss Love. I am forever on Taylor's side, and I guess I didn't even consider that someone would be wild enough to talk poorly about her, so I just liked it. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. I'll be more careful when liking posts in the future. Okay, back to rehearsal. Love you, Taylor. Child, you want to know something? I'm about sick of her because you want to know something. Isn't this the same fucking line that he used last week when T.S. Madison went and, and they had that whole situation? For those of you who did not watch the last episode and aren't aware of what I'm talking about, last week, Todrick Hall came under fire because he had created a GoFundMe, which he says that was because because of his fam his um fans encouraged him to create one because his family home or the wherever his family was staying at, a rented home or whatever the case was, had caught fire. His brother had called him. He says, I don't never FaceTime or whatever the case is when but I guess he said he don't FaceTime, period. But it's funny, funnily enough, he FaceTimed T.S. Madison when that whole situation came down and we saw the FaceTime when she flipped over the phone and showed it to the camera. But he don't FaceTime. But back to the story. So he, um, there was a whole situation where it was just like, 
he said that he wasn't going to, um, he went and created the GoFundMe, whatever the case was, because he wanted to raise money. Mind you, he had a whole house full of expensive shit that he could have just pawned or sold or whatever the case you want to call it to be able to give his family the 10 grand to get a new home or whatever the case was. But he said he got no money. I get it, pandemic, all this other stuff was going on, the strikes and everything that was going on, I get that. But when you are on YouTube showing off all your expensive shit in your mansion that you're talking about, you're trying to sell for $9 million, um, sis, it doesn't look good. The the optics doesn't look good on your, on your behalf. So he went, so there was that, with the whole thing with that. And then T.S. Madison, you know, well, Craig, was sassing up the whole situation, left the voice note, <laughs> and then immediately he called back. So it's funny how you in rehearsals, but you're spending more time on your phone than actually rehearsing. So at what point do you rehearse? Because he immediately called back for that, and then he had time to get on social media to like a post about Taylor Swift. Well, quiet as it's kept, him and Taylor ain't been friends for years because she's kind of come caught on to his bullshit. So, um... And then he's talking about an accidental like. Wasn't there another celebrity that recently did an accidental like and had to come up with a damn excuse? I think it was, wasn't it Beyonce mother that um accidentally said she likes some a shady post and then try to make an excuse? I was like, girl, you ain't accidental like that shit. Y'all know exactly what y'all doing. And that's the same thing I'm thinking about Frederick. Now, for those of y'all don't remember, yesterday we talked about this. That Courtney made headlines. She's fifty nine, by the way, during an interview with the Standard that she pu- that was published on April twelfth, where she threw shade at a number of different people, including Taylor Swift and Beyonce, saying, "And now, you know, with me, like I said, I'm not buying this excuse." And as I stated, for someone who need deep in rehearsals, he found time to be on his phone and immediately called back TS. And then this situation. And then also, let's not forget, look, Taylor ain't been fucking with, with Todd for the longest. So I think he's in his Delulu period. Well, he's always in his Delulu period. Maybe him and J-Lo need to collaborate on a song together because they both delusional. And then um, remember, let's also not forget that she shaded him in her Karma music video with the whole Disney rep, I mean, not Disney, with the Wizard of Oz reference and, and all that other stuff in the Yellow Brick Road. So we not, I'm not going, you know, you can sit up here and pretend whatever, 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 but sis. The proof is in the pudding. Taylor ain't been fucking with him for years, but he wants everybody to believe that they're cool or whatever. And I'm feeling like maybe he was using her or whatever. He thought this was an opportunity with him being good friends with Taylor because he appeared in her Look What You Made Me Do music video. And then she had all those drag queens, and, and you know, when she was pulling them in her videos at one period. And then, you know, he was at, with her at the VMAs. It was the VMAs, right? Or was it the Grammys? But they jumped on stage. He had that pink hair. So... Um, and she won that award. So, and she tried out all the gays, like, you know, it was the next big accessory, like she likes to do when it comes to friends. I don't put nothing past Taylor either. So I think they're both opportunistic. So in a way, I'd be feeling like y'all use each other, I guess. But anyway, I'll keep you guys abreast of the stories. Well, I don't think there's much more to the story, in my opinion. So I'll just say this. Let me know what y'all think down in the comments below. Okay, so um, speaking of comments, let's get to some. <laughs> um, it's a pink had a warning, and I know where it was at a bright beam during a section kept flashing. And it says, I think you're the oldest one going to this show. What are you talking about for Charlie XCX? <laughs> the oldest. Well, you want to know something? Here's a gag. A lot of people don't know this, but I was sitting there like, I saw a lot of older people, and it wasn't, they were, and a couple of them didn't even have kids, was at Olivia Rodrigo's concert. So sometimes I feel like my prejudices, I'll be having to think like, okay, you a little too old to be at this uh, Olivia Rodrigo concert. Why are you, and you singing all the work, but I'm like, look, there's a lot of older people, and, and I shouldn't probably look at it this way, because it's like, as someone who likes to maintain a youth, first of all, like I said, I'm not that damn old. I'm two days older than Beyonce, <laughs> but she, um, she was, she's nine four. I'm nine two. So, um, with that being said, 
Um, I like to keep a youthful spirit, and I feel like I'm young at heart. And all this other first of all, being in your 40s ain't that damn old. So I don't know why people want to make that assumption. Uh, maybe I need to get that out of my brain too. But a lot of times I like to keep my ears to the street to what's going on and young young kids' music and all this other stuff. So that way I know what's going on. Like I went yesterday, I will tell you this. I couldn't, I don't know, for some reason I couldn't sleep. I didn't fall asleep until like three in the morning. So I went down this whole Conan Gray rabbit hole. And I was like, because he has a new album out. I also think he's a part of our community. But I don't want to send out the children. I'm going to let's keep it going. He's cute. A little young. I don't want to hunt him, but he's cute. And I like his songs. And I like the whole idea of him doing like the whole glam rock thing. You know, he worked with Max Martin, who's a great producer, songwriter. Uh, Madonna, when you're going to release that, that collaboration you did with him. That's what I need to know when you're going to release the, the Max Martin collabos. But I like Conan. Like, um, I like his music. He's got great hair. <laughs> he can sing. And I feel like he's up there in the same level as like a, Olivia Rodrigo, that he's very influential in regards of like what he's doing. In regards, of, like, you know, very few Gen Zers are actually out here giving quality music and live performances. So um, there's that. And I said, yeah, I can't be around a lot of flashing lights if they do a lot. And then it's like, if they really fast and go on for a while, it could trigger a seizure for me. Oh, yeah, because I know, like, you have, um, you're prone to seizures. I remember you telling me that. So we know, thanks to his former assistant, the shade she threw at Todrick. Mm -hmm. Yep, because Tommy Italiano, I think, just recently did a video talking about it, too. You know, he stayed um, coming for Todrick. And I said, but I'm going to be honest, I think most of us are opportunists when we see an, opportuni um, an opportunity. Well, We'll take it. So that's where I feel Taylor is like us. I'm nearing 40. I relate to Billy. It's real life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Okay. Now, speaking of. Um, speaking of uh, Taylor Swift. So now I was with her with the other one. But if this is what you out here doing, girl. I might have to side eye you and throw a little more shade in your direction. So word on the street is that Paris Hilton was kicked out of a Coachella VIP after party room to make room for Tay Tay and Travis Kelsey. So according to The Sun, after week one of Coachella that was met with a star-studded list of attendees, celebrities made their way to the famous Neon Carnival after party where they continued to party the night away. At the famous bash, Paris and her husband Carter Room were spotted dancing on a VIP stage alongside Real Housewives star Oh, did, she's in good standing with her with her auntie Kyle. I guess so. Jeff Bezos' fiance, Lauren Sanchez. Well, what else she gonna do? And others. Remember when she sidebar? Remember when Lauren Sanchez was the original host of So You Think You Could Dance? Yeah, bitch. I'm taking it all the way back. She used to host that before Cat Dealey slid her way up in there, or they replaced her with Cat Dealey, which I think is a much better host. But let's continue. So it says Jeff Bezos' fiance, Lauren Sanchez, and others until they were reportedly seen booted off the stage to make room for America's favorite couple. Speak for yourself, because she ain't my favorite couple. Taylor and Travis. An eyewitness at Neon Carnival claimed to the USN, all of a sudden, about 20 people were ushered to the end of the platform and seemed to be being kicked off to make way for a big arrival. There, I mean, they were all seen clambering down the stairs and into a dark VIP bar area as more than five security guards started prepping the tables and getting themselves into position. The onlooker explained that the famous group were all were all be ushered off the stage. I don't know. That, uh, that, uh, that line didn't make sense, but whatever. But so it says that the famous group were all ushered off the stage around 2 a.m. because another A-list celebrity was expected to arrive soon. The uh, And although this could have been taken as a snub, the eyewitness says Paris and her friends seemed unbothered and they were fully aware the time was limited as someone else was arriving. Well, it's fine because you know what? Paris is, understands the, the name of the game and the industry and she's probably back in the day done the same thing. Back when Paris Hilton was hot, she was hot. <laughs> you know, they was ushering people out of the way for her to come in. This is the name of the game. You know, unfortunately, I know people, like regular Joe Schmo people will look at this as, who the fuck is she doing here? You know, all that stuff. But I was like, I don't give a fuck. I'll part, I'll, I will sit and dip, drop that kitty down low and dip her and do it wherever I can. 
regardless of who's in the room. Like I will, I'll sit, I can still party. It don't matter oh, who this bitch thinks she is pushing me out the goddamn way. Fuck her. I'm like, I'm not gonna be doing, I'm still be doing my dr- you know, drinking, partying, having a good time, all this other stuff. It don't matter if Taylor and Travis are gonna come up in there and have their little makeout sessions, or whatever, so they could be on camera. And then I remember there was a story, I can't remember um the name of Taylor's ex-boyfriend. There was a story that had came out that um I think he's like a British actor, or whatever. Their relationship didn't work out because she wanted all the, the the fame and the spotlight and everything on her, making it all about her. Because she likes to pretend she doesn't like the spotlight. She does. It's an all. It's all an act. So she liked all this attention. She wanted all that stuff back, but the ex didn't want that because he likes all the privacy. He likes. He doesn't want to be in the spotlight, which I think maybe is why he likes doing his little acting gigs here and there and doesn't want to be like this big mainstream celebrity and doesn't want to be in the face of the public eye. Like I think the same thing with uh, Guy Ritchie and Madonna. It's like Madonna loves the spotlight. Guy Ritchie loves being behind the scenes of the filmmaker. He has a new movie out this week. It's like as soon as him and Madonna divorced and he got a little money from her because she had to pay him. You know, he went off and he's been consistently making a lot of movies. He's been getting critical acclaim and the movie's been doing well at the box office. He has a new one out this week with Henry Cavill in it. Sidebar. Henry Cavill's about to be somebody daddy. Unfortunately, he ain't going to be the gays, but he going to be somebody daddy. Because <laughs> he done knocked up his girlfriend of, of three years. Child, some people say she a beard. I'm not going to get into that. Because I've heard some stories from my publicist told me some tea. But um, I'm not revealing it here. <laughs> but anyway, so I say all this to say, I feel this is not much ado about nothing. You know, they came in, they partied. They said that the pair looked head over heels for each They looked head over heels for each other at the after party. And they were seen drinking, laughing, and kissing. And they danced... Uh, well, the DJ set was done by James Kennedy from Vanderpump Rules, which makes sense as to why Kyle and all of them was up in there. So, you know, regardless of the situation, James is definitely, even though I can't stand him on that show, he's definitely getting a lot of gigs about it and, you know, doing Coachella. I remember, I think he made a big deal about doing Coachella last year. So, and they said that once James noticed the power couple came out to support him, he gave a sweet shout out to them as he blasted one of Taylor's hit songs for the crowd. But the question is, were they just there to just party or were they there for James? And you know, some of these people are so narcissistic, they really be thinking that somebody is there for them. But if that's what you want to believe, that's if you like it, I love it, is what I like to say. I want to yuck nobody young. <laughs> well, at least not today. I'm in a good mood. <laughs> but anyway. Um, let's get to the comments. It says Billy talks about wanting to commit to unaliving herself. Even in the documentary, she told her mom she was close to jumping. It was after the unwanted backlash that after she won album Grammy over. And you know what? This is why a lot of y'all gotta find a way to tune out the noise. This I'm so glad I didn't grow up in the era of social media. I feel for these kids that grow up in the era of social media because it's like they don't understand how to cope and deal with their emotions outside of the internet. I'm glad I grew up in a time when the internet was, when computers were a thing, but the internet wasn't a thing. When it was like you had a computer and you played video games, it was like a little dot going across the screen and you had to catch it or like Pac-Man or whatever that type of stuff. I'm glad I grew up in the era of arcades and, and, you know, actually going outside and touching grass and all that stuff. So, but these days it's just like these, these younger generations, it's like, and then if I got into fights in school, which I did, it's like you get into a fight in school, it was over. They talked about it the next day at school, and then everybody moved on. It didn't live on social media. So I'm glad that I got to go in those areas. Sometimes I won a fight, sometimes I lost a fight. And I'm glad that it's still not living on social media. So I feel for a lot of the kids that are going through, you know, living in this social media time period because it's like, a lot of y'all don't know how to cope with your emotions. And then you get these trolls that go, you didn't deserve the Grammy. Who are you to determine? Like, it's a fucking award. Who cares? You're not winning it. So why am I getting all upset that some celebrity that you, that your fave didn't win the award that you felt that they should have won? It's like, how does that help you at the end of the day? So when I went to see Janet, I saw teens and I saw a couple of seniors. So it's just like, you know, any, everybody's going to show up at... Um, but I guess Janet is 
different because I guess what I'm the way I'm looking at it is Janet is a woman of a certain age, whereas Olivia Rodrigo is 21. She just turned 21 because she always tells about, and you know, she's a Pisces because she mentioned a couple of times on the show, you know, for the three times I had to see it. Um, so she just had a birthday, but it's like, yeah, it kind of looks so. I, I guess maybe it's just that whole attitude of like, you know, you always think that older people that go to concerts where somebody is a little past their demographic is like the ch it's that chest and the molester mentality. So I just gotta stop thinking that. I'm just saying, like, yeah, I like some current artists, but I wish people would stop trying to copy each other's sound. I that and uh, it's unfortunate because it's like it's just the industry being lazy and i also want to shout out ray who won all those awards at the brit Awards. she won like six and she was recently she did an interview with rolling stone that's floating around youtube definitely gotta check that out because that was a good one where she's talking about how the shadiness of the music industry especially when it comes to songwriters that songwriters are literally not making money to support themselves and how They'll literally wait to the last minute. They won't even tell you for a while that they're the songs you worked on with an artist they're gonna use. They'll wait to the last minute, do a whole little uh, you know, a, a email blast or whatever, and let you know, like, well, you have until this certain period to decide, you know, because everybody's fighting over that 10%. If you're gonna want to work with this, uh, we're, if we're gonna use your song. And so you've got all these songwriters who are trying to make money to pay their bills and eat and all this other stuff fighting over getting that credit on that new Beyonce song, on that new Ariana Grande song, on that new Justin Timberlake song, whoever mainstream act that y'all got out here. So she was exposing a lot of these shady songwriters and I guess because she's independent, she could do that. And she's won all these awards and, and the industry was just like, oh no, we want you to do a bunch of dance songs. She was like, no, I just thought what I want to do. And so she went and took her career into her own hands. And she basically was like, and then she showed that she was that girl by winning all those Brit Awards, which is the British version of the Grammys. So what I liked about her is that she's in a position of power that, you know, um, of, I guess, gradually going into the mainstream because she's a Brit Award winner, multi-Brit Award winner. She used her her platform to speak out where I wish a lot of you mainstream people would do that, more of you that are benefiting and making all this money. But I don't feel like they're going to do that because a lot of them like to run around acting like they write a lot of these songs when they didn't. So why would they come out and, and speak out when they're benefiting from the very thing? I said, but Taylor's high school girl act is going to work when she's 40. I'm surprised it still works for her now at almost 35. Well, because, you know, 35, she's still at that mid-period. She's, you know, in the words of Britney Spears, not a girl, not yet a woman. <laughs> so um, she can still play in that period. But yeah, once she starts to transition into that late 30s period, they're going to be like, mm, sis, time to grow up. That's why I don't know how people feel I think um, Robert was talking about yesterday when he was messaging me, I think he was saying something or another in regards to like Taylor, that I guess the fans are getting more upset because she's still doing the same type of music with Jack Atnoff. And I said, child, this is why I said, like when it was talking about like, when Courtney said what she said about her, I was like, where's the lie? Like she's, she is kind of boring. She's not giving anything memorable or eventful when it comes to the music she does. It's the fact that this industry, because y'all looking for that white queen, y'all need, y'all want y'all version of Beyonce. So y'all, you know, white people in mainstream spaces love to celebrate mediocrity. Because y'all looking for that girl to, for y'all, for your little white kids to bow down to. They don't want them looking up to a Beyonce or somebody influential. It says it's easier the way streaming costs it because kids don't like change. Billy did that with Happier and even doing 50s hard rock and blonde hair at Bond. She went back to her goth look. Well, look, you can't keep doing the same thing forever. So I don't know why. Um, the success came back because that's what people fell in love with when they first met her. But I was like, why would you want to listen? Like to me, I was like, I want my artists to evolve. I want to listen to 
them try out and experiment and do different things. I don't want to, I mean, if what's the point of making music? If you're going to keep creating the same song over and over and over and over. And could we blame the industry for creating that monster where it's just like, you don't want to allow your artists to take risks and grow and evolve and change up their sound and do different things because you feel like, oh, what, the thing that worked and we made so much money from, let's continue that. Let's have them continue to do the same thing so that we, we can have that easy amount of cash constantly coming in. So Paris Hilton had her fame, and we know Paris is a victim of the tabloid culture of the 2000s. That's why she had no, she said no to Madonna in L.A., same with Britney Spears. But I'm like, that, it would have been nice if they could have got up on stage with her and did the um, the Vogue segment. So a 21-year-old would have the younger crowd and see the tour instantly sell out. Yeah, but you know, older people love their concerts too. Look at Billy Joel, who just had his final concert at my job on Sunday that was broadcast on Paramount Plus. It's, a, it's also a different culture. Her audience acts like her. They're all college kids, and Taylor cares more for awards and critical acclaim, which started with folklore. Well, she can keep liking that, and I will continue to not like her music. <laughs> Although I do like 1989. I'm not going to deny that that that's that that's not an album that i don't listen to or i have listened to but i guess it's because of the it's because of the production on there it's part of the traumatic um saying staying the same is comfortable thing for people i mean it is which is why a lot of times but here's the thing whatever i deal with com whatever i want things that i deem comfortable be it a tv show movies whatever because i'm hearing and this is an example disney plus i'm hearing is going to create channels on the streaming service. So that way, like, if you want to watch, it's sort of like Pluto or I can't say, no, I can't say um, Tubi because Tubi doesn't have like a little channel thing that you can go on. Shutter does the same thing. Shutter, I don't even, I, I don't know. Cause the other day I went on Shutter, they had three channels usually that you can scroll through. And then they have like their, their list of, you know, loop movies that they have on a loop or whatever the case is that you can watch. Although when I went on there two nights ago, I only saw one channel was uploaded. So I'm like, did they get rid of the other channels and it's just one flat channel? So I'm hearing that Disney Plus is going to be doing the same thing. So I guess it's like if you want to watch Star Wars, whatever the case is, they have something that's set and you can go on there, hit the channel and then just have something on. Because a lot of times, the truth, truth be told, when it comes to whenever I'm doing articles and stuff on my show, I like to have something on in the background to keep me, you know, my brain occupied while I'm working. So that's usually what I do. It's like I'll put on, which is why I think I watch a lot of YouTube videos. Well, every now and again, I will go on Shutter and I'll po put on one of the channels and I'll have that playing in the background and I'll glance up with one of my eyes and look over to see like, okay, what's going on? And then I'll be working on articles and stuff for the show, whatever the case is. So I'm hearing that they're they're you know they're doing something like that, which and which brings me to this whole thing of like you know comfort food in regards of like. TV shows, movies, whatever. Same thing with my music. If I'm feeling like I want to go back and and feel the comfort with an old album, I'll go back and listen to old Billie Eilish. But I feel like, or any or whoever your fave is. But I feel like if you're expecting that artist to just keep giving you the same album over and over and over and over and over again, then what's the point of making music or just creating art? Period. It's the same kind of I feel like about. Um, I mean, look at Charlie XCX. Is she still is she doing the same music over and over and over? Like, I don't think so. She's changing up her sound. Troy Savon changed up his sound a little bit. He went and got a little more up, he went a little more up tempo with his with his album. And so there are people out here who was experimenting. But I guess if you want to be, I guess if you're a smaller act, you can get away with that versus a mainstream act. Except Madonna, you can't tell her shit. She's going to continue to keep evolving and doing different types of things, whether her fans be pissed off or not. I said, Taylor's problem is her music isn't really memorable. Well, tell that to her fans. I said, this is why Crystal watches old TV shows, because she knows how it ended. I mean, I watch a lot of old TV shows, too, for the nostalgia. Like, I watch, like, Charms, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Sex in the City. These are all the shows I've been revisiting. Um... 
RuPaul's Drag Race. Like whenever I like that's like one of my top comfort foods is RuPaul's Drag Race. Like I told you, I'm on All Stars Three, and we have a segment, we have a topic coming up about All Stars Three later on in the show. But RuPaul's Drag Race is definitely like one of my top comfort food type shows where it's just like I have it on, I watch it, even though I know what's gonna happen, I continue, you know, to watch it. Me too. I'm waiting for Late Night with the Devil too. Oh, it's coming out this weekend. So, which makes sense is why David Dosmalchian um, was on. He was he was doing a live stream from from uh, the Shutter Instagram yesterday, and I've te- and I wrote something in there. First of all, I like him. Um, I was I've seen him in a couple of things. Like he was in the Dark Knight. Now I feel like now he's starting to get his mainstream status or leading man status. And I love the few times that he's appeared on Dragula as a guest judge so he's clearly someone who loves horror and that whole genre so yeah i didn't know it was coming out this weekend but yes definitely i will be checking that out because that's been a movie that i've been waiting to see a pop-up on shutter for um a while so i'm actually excited about that but yeah he was on he did a q a thing with um on um instagram live on the shutter uh website or the shutter ig page i should say and it's actually what happened with paris was she didn't see madonna's message yeah i remember that um and kathy griffin spilled that tea or whatever but i think paris would have done it but she said that she was kind of scared because you know she is one of the things i think people would be shocked to know is that paris said she's shy in real life and a lot of people are like people i think a lot of people don't realize that celebrities or people who do this type of thing, introvert or extroverts. Like I would identify myself as an introverted extrovert, which is somebody who is very much, I'm very quiet, stay to myself. Like if I'm in a in a crowded room or whatever, I'm kind of like off in the in the corner. I'll hang out. If if I'm intro like if I'm in public place, hey, how are you? Or whatever, whatever, whatever. It's not me being standoffish. It's just you know, my Virgo be Virgoing. <laughs> so I'm kind of off just like analyzing everything, just taking everything in, always keeping my eye out for where the exits are, which is what a lot of us do. Cause I'm very good at an Irish goodbye. Um we have one one minute you see me, then the next minute you don't. So um yeah, so I, I am someone who is a very much an introvert extrovert, and the uh, and then when but when it's time for the lights camera action, is when I'm I'm you know I'm ready to go, and then Robert says there was a time when you could get away with it during the album era, but because it's a singles era, that's what led to this. We not being honest, being a singles era room. Well, yeah, it has room music for some people, and this is why I applaud those like Beyonce like Charlie, like so many others who are like, no, I'm going to, I'm creating an album. I'm giving y'all an album. Or like Ariana Grande, even even though I didn't like her last record, I do like the idea. She's like, you know what? I'm just going to put out this one song. The rest of it is an experience that you're going to have to get by listening to the album. And they are not getting another single or another video or whatever the case is. I mean, I'm sure I'll release video singles down the road, but for the most part, you're getting this one single with this cold-hearted snake music video ripoff. And um, I'm going to give you the full album experience. So I love people who are still willing to put out full albums and not just thinking, well, I'm just going to do singles. If that's what you want to do, then that's great. But which quiet is this Kev? I think J-Lo should have stuck to just doing singles. Because at one point I was like, why is she not putting out full albums? She should put out, you know, she's been giving us singles. Then that album came out. Now we know why. Another thing, speaking of rabbit holes, I went down a whole you know, people who had bad experiences with J Lo rapping all yesterday too. So, um, but but I've recovered. I'm out of it now. I went down this. I went into a K hole with J Lo. Anyway, so oh, she get oh yeah. I think a lot of people do. Um, I remember. I remember one time when I go out before I get out on stage, or whatever. You get those butterflies. You get stage fright. But then it's like it it lasts literally a second. It's like you have to psych yourself out and force yourself to be like, oh, nope, you know why you're here. Those people are here to see you. You can't be, it's not about your ego. You need to get past that and you push through. Because a lot of times I do it too. Notice how everybody's copying Beyonce, the no singles, the album drops. Yeah, and, and also I think it's, um, music videos are expensive. So people don't have the way, they're like, I'm going to just save the experience for the tour. 
And I actually think that's the smart thing. It's like save money on the music. I mean, if you want to put out one video to support your music or whatever, just to get let people know that an album is coming, I'm here for that. But for the most part, it's like, no, you'll get the experience when you come see the live show. Okay, so now let's move on to our next topic. And I'm glad that I was getting through those because, child, this one is a mess. Let's talk about this coon, Jared Carmichael. Who, the more he opens his mouth, the more stupid he sounds. So he's addressing the criticism he received over a race play joke made in his new horrible ass HBO series that I don't know one person is watching. But let's continue. So now he appeared yesterday, which would be Tuesday on The Breakfast Club, and he confronted co-host Charlemagne the God, who last week, rightfully so, named him Donkey of the Day after Carmichael stirred controversy with a viral clip from his, ex, his Mac series, Jerry Carmichael Reality Show, which some criticizes being about slave play. He said, and I quote, because I'm not going to play the clips and stuff here due to copyright, but let's continue. So it says, you play a clip of my stand-up, but it started at the punchline, and it like completely erased the setup of it. This is what he said and said that he wasn't, uh, he was a fan of the show and a friend of Charlemagne's. He says, I really don't like that. It made me seem like I was talking like I'm into some type of race, sexual slavery role play with my boyfriend, which is untrue. He added, it's so false. And I expect that type of thing from TMZ because they have no humanity. They don't care about people that get hurt when they report these sort of things, but you're a friend. So I really didn't like that. Now let's address that before we get to the rest. Number one, with me and when it comes to my friends, celebrity or non-celebrity, if you say some dumb shit, regardless of the situation, you are getting donkey of the day and I'm calling you out on it. That's what a true friend does. No shade, just saying. Just know that you're going to get it from both sides. You're not just, I'm not one of those friends that's just, tell me about my eyes. Am I pretty today? I'm not going to smoke up your ass. If that's the type of friend you want, go be friends with Jennifer Lopez because this is not what that is. You're going to get the real from over here. So, when you go and say, um, that's not what that is, that's exactly what that was. Like, you've clearly said many times in your situation that, you know, you've been traumatized and hurt by people in your own community, which is so many ways is why you gravitate towards white men. And my thing is, I've said this many a times, as someone who is a product of, you know, mixed race, my father is Black, my mother is not, um, I have no problem with interracial relationships. I have a problem with people who get in interracial relationships at the benefit of their own people. Meaning, you can get with a white person, you can get with an Asian person, you can get with an Armenian person, you can get with anybody else that's non-black, but you don't have to shit on your own people in order to uplift them people over there. You don't need to do that. And to me, that's what he pretty much has given. And why are you only going in on Charlemagne? Because Charlemagne wasn't the only one that talked about this whole race play situation. It went viral everywhere. So is everybody that was talking about this on their shows just showing that one little clip that you claim was the punchline? I have yet to hear a laugh come from what you said because quiet as it's kept, Jerry Carmichael ain't funny. This is yet again the industry propping up some unfunny comedian to be the representation of a whole community. He don't represent me. First of all, I didn't know who the fuck Jared Carmichael was until I saw the white publications bringing him up last year. I think it was last year when he came out with that. When did he come out with that Rothaniel special, whatever the case was? When that first started circulating, I had heard about him, but I didn't care enough to want to sit down and watch his show or the special or hear about him coming out because he always, first of all, I've always looked at Jared Carmichael as somebody who's just straight up goofy. Like, he just looked goofy to me. And to me, it's just like, he's not my cup of tea when it comes to the type of comedy I like. It's funny how when I went to the um, the um, Sloppy Seconds podcast last week, which the, ep the episode that I was at is actually up on Spotify. Um, My friend David, who I was with, he was like, oh, I finally understand the type of humor that you like because it is very difficult to get me to laugh. Like, if you say something silly, <laughs> something stupid, like, I will sit and have a cackle. But if it's like something that's, or it's something that's an intelligent joke, like, if you're going to go and say something that is rooted in what some people would call problematic jokes, like, I love 
I love him. I, I love a messy joke. I love a, like people like Bianca Del Rio, Joan Rivers, Lady Bunny. Those type of their type of humor will have me in stitches on the floor, damn near pissing my pants. People like Bernie Mac, I found funny. When I look at people like a Steve Harvey, a Jared Carmichael, a Ber- I mean, like what's his name, um, Senator the Entertainer, a, um, a Tiffany Haddish, a Kevin Hart, I don't find none of their humor funny. I'd be looking, I'd be sitting there like this the whole time. And I'd be ready to turn that shit off. I even was embarrassed when when with some more's last comedy special that she had on Netflix. Normally she's funny. I'm like, what the fuck happened here? I guess anybody that's on a Netflix contract, the jokes just go down the toilet. But anyway, so it said, so he was basically saying that this not what this was. But I'm like, that's exactly what it was. It was saying you're into racial race sexual slavery role play. He said it's so false, and I expect that type of. Oh, I read that part. He said then the scene in question, what they were talking about, was the comedian telling jokes about his relationship during a stand up gig where he said, My boyfriend, he makes me smarter. He makes me read. I have so many books. Realistically, I'm not going to read all the books. He knows that. But, for, but the fact that I bought them says, I love you. The little monuments around my apartment, just like, look at this book from Amazon that I'm never going to read. Okay. So, and he says, I sometimes joke to him that our relationship is like that of a slave and a master's son who, like, teaches me how to read by candlelight. Well, I got the joke. That's what he was saying. I was like, and that's what I was going to say before I even read the rest of it. I was just like, well, why does this feel like some shit out of Roots? Where it's like, or or a scene from, um, you know, Kizzy was learning how to read and she got slapped. Because I'm about to spell my name K-I-Z-Z-Y. Remember that scene from Roots? And then um, there was another. Then there was another one with um, the color purple. When Nettie taught Sydney how to read, had all them little stickers all over the the food. The like, apple, A P P L E, apple. And then you know all the different things. And then Mister comes in the room. So uh, uh-uh, you ain't gonna be learning how to read up in this house. So that's what it was just giving. It's like, oh, you give him all these books. So it's like you definitely made a joke about you know you being in a relationship with a white dude, where it's like it makes it feel like. His quote, a relationship like it's a slave and a master's son who like teach me how to read by candlelight. And then a lot of the audience was upset about it, rightfully so. And he said, yeah, he groans too because he's a good person. He doesn't like that effing joke. I like that joke. That's my burden. I think that shit's hilarious. Okay, well, it could be funny to you. And I guess what they say, like, you know what? Comedy is subjective. That what you find funny, other people are going to find funny. And then, and I guess what really is bothering Black people is not the fact that you told the joke. Now, if you're going to sit up in here and poke fun in your, inter- your interracial relationship, that's perfectly fine. But I think what bothers Black people is that you're making this joke in front of white folks about black and slavery and all the other stuff, which already rubs people the wrong way because there are, and let's be clear when we talk about this, there are people of color who have a problem with mixing races because of the narrative that the media likes to perpetuate when it comes to interracial relationships. See how all that works? It's cyclical. (laughs) It's like me trying to break it on down. So I think that's why people are upset, particularly black people are upset. And then Charlemagne clarified that when he played the clip was only part of the episode he had seen, but Carmichael, you know, clapped back by saying, yeah, but I need you to watch the show. And anybody who watches the show knows it's not what I said. It's so false. It's so untrue. And I don't like that because it's like it had nothing to do with my boyfriend. It had to do with the sex that we have. It's nothing to do with sex. It's something that people have been reporting on, and I really don't like it. And... You know, people said what they said, and then um, Char- um, Carmichael told the Breakfast Club, he said, look, I get it. It's something that people have been running with because I have a white boyfriend. So, like, people try and create some type of crazy story about that. And it's a small group of people. I read all the tweets, and it's like, well, damn, you must have got no damn life. You had time to read every damn negative tweet about you. But let's continue. He says, some black men are some clan members who don't like that I have a white boyfriend. They agree on that. So, congratulations. So, now he wants to resort this shit down to just black people and clansmen are pissed because he's in a relationship with a white male. How am I too many times I'm going to say, I have no problem with you dating a white guy. The problem is when you be in this pick me coon, when you play into this pick me coon bullshit for the white gaze, the white acceptance, and the white check. 
because it ain't because clearly Jared Carmichael's demographic ain't black folks. And so he's all he's out here, you know, shucking and jiving for his boyfriend. Somebody he's a human being, he deserves respect, and he deserves and that Jared deserves respect. Not when you want to sit up out here and put your whole tea for the world to spill in reality TV form. This is what you're gonna get. And I don't feel sympathy for you, but especially when you pulled the bullshit you pulled on Tyler the Creator. At least Tyler the Creator makes no qualms about what he into in the bedroom. Being into that, he like his white boys. He's not out here defending it and all that. He's standing ten toes down on what he's what he's into, and he doesn't shit on his own people in order to let you know he likes sliding his peen in white poon. So, I applaud somebody for that, rather than you out here shucking and jiving and tap dancing for the white dollar, and then you getting mad because you you put a whole reality show out here spilling all your tea, which is full on cringe from basically the stuff that I've seen online. And then you get mad at the backlash. But that's what you're going to get when you do a reality show. You should you should ex expect that there's going to be backlash in the situation. So I'm going to need somebody to come take this shucking and jiving clown out back and put him out of his fucking misery because I'm tired of his ass. And one thing I don't like, and I keep telling people this, and I talked about this yesterday, I just can't stand when people think they are highly intelligent, try to insult my intelligence. And the more he opens his mouth, I feel like the worse he sounds, what you need to do is just own the fact that, number one, the joke is not funny. And regardless of what Charlemagne, you know, or where he started the joke, anything about race play, which is clearly this is, no matter how you slice it or dice it, isn't funny. So, and I'm going to keep reiterating when I say this, he is not a representation of the Black community, the Black queer community. Like, we need role models in this community especially since we are a marginalized group, even more so than white gays. White gays got enough people they can look up to. But it's like any of these black queer men that come out of the closet, first thing they doing is running to white men for, for you know, a, in a relationship. And I understand if you had your traumas or whatever that came up with within, you know, especially how black people, when it comes to black people and homosexuality in the church and all this stuff and how people was raised and being in the South and all those other things. But that still doesn't mean that you should just shit on an entire community because of your childhood traumas. That's what a therapist is for. Get you one or a new one, because all the times you be talking about your therapist or whatever and, and someone in the scenes of you with a therapist, clearly the shit ain't working. So I just need Jared Carbacker to please go away. I'm tired of him. Anyway, let's get to these topics. I mean, these comments. <laughs> um. It said, hey, so salutations from our favorite gym. Oh, I was planning on going to the gym today, but um, I wasn't able to make it. Please hold. What is going on? Did I plug in my phone, my um computer? Because it looked like it's about to die. Yeah. I know. This is a live show. And I don't know why it's not showing that it's plugged in. Well, hopefully it don't die on me because I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's not registering over here. Um, I don't see why it's not. Oh, my camera fell. Ciao. Sorry, this is live. <laughs> but anyway, let's just power through um, this show then because I don't think it's going to die. I think this is a pretty good, like it's a pretty good battery because I do use it up a lot. But anyway. So, um, yeah, Silla Murray's at our gym. I said, Taylor Swift sends Midnight's is, and now Billy Eilish. You won't hear anything till the whole album is out. I said, if you own the masses and the rights, you're paying for, to, uh, for the producers. Oh, excuse me. And the other stuff, because the major label is just there for promotion and distribution. The rest is up to you. Mm hmm. It says, so he's into race play and says his white boyfriend introduced him to reading. Yeah, like you didn't know how to read before you got into your relationship. All of a sudden, that's why I say it felt very much like something out of Roots or The Color Purple. Now, I was going to teach you how to, I was going to teach this nigga how to read. Come on over here, boy. Like, that's what it's given. Can't stand people like him. Anyway, it's a, well, there's truth in comedy. So, what he's saying, he's joking. He's talking. I've been said that, Jay. Um, he, I didn't know some more was Neil Long. I didn't, I, is she? I must have. I think I knew that, but I forgot. 
But look, there's a lot of famous people out here we didn't know about. If they, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. That's why I said one thing I don't like about people who claim that they're highly intelligent, like to play in my damn face, like they smarter than me. It's like, no, I will outsmart your ass. Trust and believe. It's a correction. We need positive and corrective promotion of black LGBTQ plus role models. Mm -hmm. And if the white people don't want to do it, it's like, we'll do it ourselves and all the other ones like Gay Magazine and so many others that uplift and bring stories about what's going on with black queer people in entertainment and in just news in general because child it's, it'd be a mess but anyway um oh so i was like what am i doing let's move on and talk about kelly clarkson who's going through it still with her ex-husband so her ex-husband and former manager, Brandon Blackstock, is firing back at the lawsuit she filed against him in March. Now, Blackstock demanded the pop star's lawsuit demanding he return millions be tossed out of court. According to court documents obtained by Radar Online, Blackstock and Starstruck management scoffed at the recent cross-complaint filed by Clarkson. As previously reported, Clarkson signed with Starstruck management in 20, 2007 sorry, and agreed to pay 15%. Starstruck was formed by Blackstock's father, Narvell. Blackstock worked as Starstruck and served as Clarkson's manager for over a decade. Clarkson and Blackstock were married from 2013 to 2020. The exes started fighting over commissions after the split. Now, Starstruck has filed their four, first lawsuit in L.A. Superior Court. The company accused Clarkson of refusing to pay commissions owed on work they secured for her. The company said she owed $1.4 million for income earned for the Kelly Clarkson show and The Voice. In response, the pop star filed a petition with the California Labor Commission. She claimed her ex never obtained a license to serve as a talent agent. She argued he should not have legally been working to secure her gigs. In addition, she accused him of overcharging her on commissions. The lawsuit filed by Star Trek was put on hold until the Labor Commission reached a decision. In November 2023, the California Labor Commission ruled that Blackstock should not have booked gigs without the license. The Labor Commission ordered Blackstock to pay back Clarkson $2.6 million in commissions he was paid. The breakdown included $1.9 million in the voice commissions, $450,000 for a Wayfair deal, and another two hundred dollars for a cruise line partnership. Star Trek and Blackstock filed an appeal of the decision. Well, child, it's a whole lot that's going up in here. And my thing is... Um, I guess maybe, you know, with her being married to him, she she just trusted that he was going to do what needed to be done. But I'm like, but wait a minute. If he's not licensed to be doing this stuff, how does she sit and allow him to just be out here making these deals for her? Or maybe he was doing it behind her back. Or maybe what it was, like I said, that her being married to him, she wasn't paying attention to... Um, what it was in in regards to her business and her dealings because a lot of times this is why a lot of celebrities get ripped off and talk about how they don't be having the things that they be having is a lot of them do not pay attention to their business endeavors that's going on and my thing is this i'm too much of a control freak to just be like okay so now my agent knows other stuff is gonna be over here doing whatever i'm gonna be paying close attention to what you're doing so that way i make sure that you're not ripping me off or whatever the case was and he was taking kickbacks Similar to um, Latasha husband, allegedly. So I say, let's say this thing is probably going to get uglier and uglier. I don't see this stopping anytime soon. We'll, I'll definitely keep you abreast of this story as it goes on. And I told, I met Claire Clarkson back um, when I lived in LA. She came to my job and she was with her kids. I think she was also with Brandon and. She was nice. He was kind of off doing his own thing or whatever. But yeah, so there was that. And this was around the time when I believe this was the summer before her actual talk show kicked off. So she was in the the process. The show was in the pro, was already greenlit and it was supposed to be happening. So it was like maybe four or five years ago. Okay, so let's move on to talking about my girl, Wendy Williams. How you doing? Speaking of people and courts and things and being sued. So Wendy Williams' guardian, Sabrina Morrissey, filed papers in the star's divorce demanding that her ex-husband return $112,500 to her after she said he was overpaid in their divorce agreement. Now, according to Radar Online, Hunter previously petitioned a court after he stopped receiving money that Williams agreed to pay him as a condition of their divorce. He said he had received severance payments since 2021. As, this outlet, as the outlet reported, 
Wendy was placed under court-ordered guardianship in 2022, leaving Morrissey in charge of her finances. In the court, filing obtained by the U.S. Sun, Morrissey argued that per the marital settlement agreement, the severance payments were to end if Williams' annual income dropped below a certain amount. She claimed that Williams' income dipped significantly in October of 2021 when she stopped hosting the Wendy Williams show, saying, and I quote, she continued to pay Mr. Hunter. He says in his motion papers that he was paid through January of 2022. As a result, Kevin has been unjustly enriched by the receipt of $112,500. That's $37,500 for three months belonging to Wendy. Williams guardianship requested the money be returned to the media mogul and moved for a gag order to prevent Hunter from discussing the matter. She also urged his request to reopen the case in court gets dismissed, su suggesting arbitration instead. Hunter has requested that the payments resume, demanding Williams' financial records from their divorce to the present be released. Now, he was married to her from November 1999 to January 2020, and they had one child together. So, yeah, they were married for a long time. I think it was like over 20 years. They were married for as long as, you know, I think they, they had a child together. And he cheated on her throughout the whole damn marriage. Let's not forget that. Um, and, you know, um, Kevin Jr. is emancipated and is a full-time student at Barry University in Florida, saying this is an um, emergent matter because I rely on severance pay for his living expenses and all those other stuff. So, yeah, because Kevin has not worked. You know, since Wendy fired him for being a low down, dirty dog and a damn cheetah. So out of the lemon as he possibly can, Sabrina is saying that he was unjustly paid a certain amount of money that he shouldn't have been paid during the period that he shouldn't have been paid. And she want that money back. And my thing is this, if she got the receipts to provide this situation, he got his receipts or whatever the case was, you know, you present it to the courts and the judge decides what he just what he decides. And if we have to keep bringing this up, part of the agreement was, OK, now, as long as she is working at the Wendy Williams show, she can still pay him the money that she's supposed to pay him that he was, uh, I guess, planning on living lavishly off of along with Sabrina. Um, Sharina, sorry, who I believe he is no longer with, and she done went back to South Carolina, and she hunching a whole new man with a baby that she had with this other man, because she thought they was going to be living the lavish life. And Wendy looked the other way, and so he brought a baby in the picture, and she could no longer sweep it under the rug, because clearly when we watched that reality show that they had, the docuseries, whatever you want to call it, Wendy was somebody who was just like, you know what, I can continue to play up this thing where it's like, oh no, if I just pretend like it's not happening, then it's not happening. But when a once a baby's in the picture you can't keep denying the fact that your husband is out here laying alone and spreading it wide with another woman for the past decade plus because sharina wasn't somebody he just met five minutes ago she met him through charlemagne so i say all this to say good luck to wendy i'm hoping that you know because we haven't heard anything negative about her thank the lord you know we're going on in regards of like her sobriety and her getting her life together and what's going on with her with the lymphedema and the Graves disease and the dementia and all the other stuff. So I'm glad that, you know what, this isn't on what's going on with her meant personally, that this is what's going on with her greedy ass ex-husband still trying to squeeze ju as little juice out of the lemon that's left. Go get a job, sir. Go get you a, a, a trucking license. Go get be a manager at Red Lobster, or oh, maybe you can't use Red Lobster because Red Lobster, word on the curb, they're about to file bankruptcy. So I don't think Red Lobster would be a good idea. Maybe go to Olive Garden or something. Get, get you, Go get you a job, sir. How about that? Okay, so we got three more topics, and then we are out of here. Um, be sure to leave comments and stuff down below if you can, if you want to. But anyway, let's talk about Halle Bailey and rumors swirling that she and DDG are done. So fans are buzzing with speculation that could the Rocky Waters be, could there be, sorry, Rocky Waters ahead for Halle Berry and DDG's relationship. Now the speculation went into overdrive on Tuesday after it was discovered that Bailey and her beau, real, real name, Daryl Dwayne Granberry Jr., were no longer following each other on Instagram. Furthermore, the duo appears to have removed most of their photos as a couple from their respective accounts. I didn't care enough to look, but if y'all go and look and y'all can corroborate this story, let me know, because I don't care enough to go over on their pages. But anyway, adding to the speculation after her solo outing at Coachella this past weekend. 
And it also showed that she took the Instagram and cheer on her sister, Chloe, after she took to the stage for an eclectic performance, saying, had the best time at Clochella last night. She gushed with a crying and heart emoji in support. Words can't describe how proud I am of my sister. DDG and Hallie welcomed their first child, a son named Halo, in December, saying, I wouldn't cho choose, wait, I wouldn't chose? I wouldn't choose no other person in the world I have a child. Yeah. You're going to eat these words. I wouldn't choose no other person in the world I have a child with. We learning. She's a great mom. Like, it's crazy. She's amazing. This is what he said just weeks ago. Yeah, okay. The couple went Instagram official in March 2022, but are known for being low-key about their relationship. Really? Because DDG wasted no time going on social media and, and alluding to the fact that Hallie was with child. Which started this whole downward spiral speculation of them gaslighting us whenever people was like, oh, she pregnant, her nose wide, she looking, she wearing baggy clothes, like all the, the, the internet sleuths were going in and was getting mad because, you know, y'all out here trying to pretend like y'all trying to piss on our leg and tell us it's raining. And people was getting mad over it. So now... You know, with this whole situation, y'all talking about y'all like to keep y'all shit private. No, y'all don't. Or at least he don't. But then it also, you know, got even worse when DDG addressed the text message scandal that rocked the pair last year after leaked messages between himself and ex Ruby Rose raised eyebrows. Rose at the time shared a screen grab that showed him asking about her plans. He tried to write it off as whatever, whatever. But Ruby was out here being messy, like him. And then um, DDG admitted to being petty and said the exchange was taken out of context. Saying, I feel like people brought thought that I was being sneaky. Like, oh, what you doing type shit. And that's when she posted it. And this is what he told of Vlad TV. He said it was a quick little argument that went completely left. And they eventually got over the hump. Yeah, whatever. Um, if this is true, you know, I don't want to shit on nobody's situation because, you know, you always want relationships to work if they're authentic and real and you're willing to put in the work. And there's a child involved, unfortunately. But to me, I've looked at Hallie and DDG as like a match made in health in the beginning. I was like, girl, I understand if you want to get a little, you know, you want to throw your ass on the circle and get some dick because we see them, them, the prints of, you know, DDG got some meat down there. And if you want to get piped down, that's great. But girl, your whole life is ahead of you. Your career is ahead of you. And you want to now you stuck with this ninja, if this is true, for the rest of your life. Because now you're having a kid with him. Or you had a kid with him. So now y'all stuck together, even if the relationship don't work. But I'm not surprised. Like, if this turns out to be true, I'm not surprised that their relationship is done. It was only a matter of time before it was going to happen. So anyway, let me know what you guys think of this story down in the... In the um, down below. Did you see this coming? Are you surprised? Are you not surprised? Are you sad? Let me know down below. Okay, so um <laughs> Sailor Marie says pretends to be shocked if it's true. We been saw this coming. Exactly. That's what I said. Okay, so now our last two topics are some drag race tea. So let's get right into that. So we finally have a day because the other day was funny because I was talking to a friend of mine and I think we were at the um, Sloppy Seconds podcast and I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. And he was like, okay, so we're almost at the end of drag race season 16. When are we going to get to know who the queens of drag race all stars nine? When are we going to find out? Like we already know who the girls are and I'm going to remind y'all um, in case y'all don't know who the alleged rumored, rumored, but child, the cat been out the bag for over a year, but we're going to, we'll entertain it as a rumor of who the queens are going to be on All Stars 9. So we finally got a date and shout out to Sherry Shepherd for spilling the tea. So with one of the three queens of RuPaul's, with one of the top three queens of RuPaul's Drag Race season 16 about to be crowned on April 19th, my money's on Sephira Crystal. Fans of the long-running hit series are wondering, when will the queens of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 9 be revealed? Now, according to comedian and daytime talk show host Sherry Shepard, the new batch of queens looking to duke it out once more for the coveted spot of 
in the Drag Race Hall of Fame, sorry, will sashay across the Sherry stage on May 9th. Now, Sherry spilled the Drag Race tea while interviewing Lopez versus Lopez stars George and Mayan Lopez. Mayan, a super fan, recently appeared as a guest judge on season 16. Sidebar, I want to give a shout out to Kevin Ortega Rojas. I don't know if y'all follow him on Instagram, but definitely follow him because he's like an openly queer Latino male, Afro-Latino. You know, he embraces his black side, even though he light skinned. And a lot of y'all don't like to act like you Latinos are part black, but you are. But anyway, let's move on. Um, He brought up something about George Lopez and how George Lopez is a piece of shit because he went on. I think he was on The View and Whoopi Goldberg threw up some misinformation um oh wait hold on let me check something because for some reason i don't know why i keep saying oh i know why it's unplugged my damn thing was unplugged the whole fucking time i'm like wait a minute it's plugged in okay so now i'm good now i don't have to rush through the show because i'm like freaking out over my battery like literally saying my battery was down on my laptop but anyway so let's continue um he was so kevin ortega rojas pulled up on Instagram, a thing about George Lopez and um, Whoopi Goldberg, he, him and his daughter, because, you know, she's been everywhere with him, um, recently appeared on The the View and Whoopi Goldberg, I guess, spews some misinformation about... Um, I actually found the article, so we'll, we'll combine it with Drag Race. But anyway, so yeah, he recently... Um, spilled the article in regards of, you know what? I'm going a, I'm to a let y'all know that story in a second. I'll get to Drag Race. We'll focus on that, and then I'll bring up the whole Kevin thing with Joy Lopez after the fact. I'll make that a separate video because then I could dive deep into that. But anyway, let's get back to Drag Race. So, um, you know, as y'all know, previous Drag Race Hall of Famers include Chad Michaels, Alaska, Trixie Mattel, Monet Exchange, Trinity the Tuck, Shea kool Kylie Sonique Love, Jinx Monsoon, and Jimbo. So the queens that are actually supposed to appear on the upcoming season, and let me share the screen with y'all so that way y'all can see um, the girls. Bring back my girls. Bring back my girls. Where do you at? <laughs> Is... And Jeria Paris Van Michaels from season 14. We got Got Mick from season 13. We got Georges from season 14. Nina West from season 11. Plastic Tiara from season 11. Roxy Andrews from season 5. All Stars 2. And Chanel from season 1. But I can think after last year when Chanel appeared on... Um, I think she did All Stars. It was like one of the Lips and Cassasses. I felt like that was the time I was like, okay, we need to get Chanel to come back on the show. And Miss Vanjie herself are all supposed to appear on the upcoming season of RuPaul's Drag Race. So I'm actually excited um, to get these queens to be a part of the show because, you know, I actually love, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race is one of my favorite shows. These are the alleged queens supposed to be coming on. So we're going to find out next month in regards of who's going to be a part of the show. Um, I know some, um, I saw some people say, okay, only eight queens. Like, why are they only doing eight queens? And then the rumor is, is because none of the queens are going to be eliminated this season, that they're going to do some type of point system or whatever the case is, because, the gag is, and I knew this before they was because they were struggling to find girls to come on the show. The girls was tired of this whole thing about having to eliminate each other, that sort of thing. And I feel like what All Stars should be, it should be a celebration of the girls who were eliminated from previous seasons. So they come on, they're spending all this money on their fashions, they're doing all this other stuff. Just have them do, you know, work to, like, this point system, whatever the case was, and they kind of lip sync for your win or whatever the case is. And then when you get to the final episode, it's like, okay, you already know we're doing 12 episodes, 14 episodes. So by the time episode 13 comes, this is the episode where it's like we pick our top three. Because that's what you should do, top three. And then the rest of the girls is, you know, they maybe have them vote or do whatever. Figure out what you could do with the other girls who don't make it in the end. But just have your top three queens, you know, fight for the crown to be up there with, you know, the other girls. So that's the way I would look at it, in my opinion. That's how I would want to see um, Drag Race or how they would do the show. So I really feel like that All Stars 9 should be a celebration of the queens and, you know, 
drag the regular drag race season, we stick with the eliminations and all that other stuff. But I feel like that's what I love about I would feel I would love about All Star. It's like not another show where they're eliminating each other or you're leaving it up to the queens to sit there and eliminate each other while RuPaul just sits there and collects a damn check and then has everybody else being hated all over social media for for removing their fave. Like we're not doing that. That shit was tired. It's late. I'm over it. I don't want it. Most people don't want it. Get creative. Say anyway. <laughs> uh, let me know who, what y'all think in the comments down below in regards of this whole situation. Are you here for this new crop of queens? Are you excited to um to see on Sherry Shepard who um you know if these the rumored queens turn out to be true? Let me know down in the comments below. All right, so. Um, oh yeah, it said um, now she's stuck with him through their child between the Ruby Rose and talking about being jealous of her career for, of her highlight in The Little Mermaid. I knew it wouldn't last. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. For the rest of herself, let this be a lesson. Be careful who you plan to share playing your baby. Exactly. Take your birth control because if these ninjas out here ain't going to want to take um, they, you know, if these men don't want to take their uh, way of condom, whatever the case is. Protect yourself in a way where it's like, you know, well, you're never going to know who you lay down with because you can think you did in the bed with the best man in the world and then turn out that he'd be an asshole. So sometimes it happens. We're not always going to get it right. But yeah, to get to that, I mean, he's like, I don't think George Lopez is funny. But yeah, this is the thing. But I'm glad you brought that up because this is what I want to bring about the whole George Lopez thing. So Kevin Ortega Rojas, who's on... Um, you know, on, who I follow on Instagram brought up this story about George Lopez and saying that he was on The View this week to promote his sitcom, Lopez versus Lopez. Now, during the interview, Whoopi Goldberg incorrectly stated that George Lopez is the only representation of Latinos on television. Now, despite this being false, George Lopez laughed it off and said that he's been on TV for 22 years, so he doesn't see the lack of representation. Maybe for Mexicans, but... um. Latinos in a whole, you don't see the lack of representation? Okay, sir. Now, last year during the podcast episode, George Lopez said that he doesn't believe he or any other Latinos should open the door or, ho or help up-and-coming Latinos. He said, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Look out for yourself. George Lopez has the access, resources, impact, and knowledge to help increase visibility of, of Latinos in mainstream media, but he refuses. His focus is on enriching himself. We should be supporting Lopez versus Lopez. The show features a beautiful, talented cast of Latino artists, but we must also hold people like George Lopez accountable. And what I have to say on that is, it's like, yeah. Um, oh, and shout out to um, Selena, because today, um, yesterday would have been her 50, she would be 53. A lot of people was cackling because I posted a picture of Jennifer Lopez as Selena. <laughs> but I was being funny. But anyway, um, I do feel like in this way, it's like, I'm all for pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and those other stuff. But we got to get out of that mentality of, okay, now for me, once I get through the door of entertainment and I made it, I'm not going to be the type of person that's going to like shut the door all the way behind me, but like, you figure out how to get in there. You figure out how to get where I'm at. Don't do that. Like, why wouldn't you want to help your people? I would help somebody like who's like, well, how do I get to be where you are? This is the tools that you need to do. Or if you think, oh, you have what it takes, oh, come down to this day and do this, 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 and this. And then um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to prove yourself. Like, help people get to where they need. Like, show them the door. Help them, you know, they can walk through that door in the words of, you know, Morpheus in the Matrix. I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through. I'm not going to shut the door right behind me, but like, well, you, well, I got the keys and everything on the other side. You need to figure out how to kick this door open and snatch the keys from my hand. So that way, you could, to me, that's being selfish. And so like when people get to certain places, and I hate when people of color do this, black folks do it. It seems like women be doing it when y'all get envious and stuff of people in certain situations. And then you get George Lopez in a situation. You should be using this opportunity to uplift and help your people you know, get to where you are eventually and not try to shut the door behind them because you're insecure. Because that's what that gives me, insecurity. So, yeah, I want to, um, it's, um, I, let me pull it up real quick so that way y'all can see in case y'all want to, definitely y'all should follow him on his um, Instagram page. So, yeah, it was like, I saw this um, article and I just felt like I need to bring it to y'all attention. 
And then Felix says, Roxy's challenge is going to be relying on herself because she doesn't have Alaska and Detox. And you want to know something? I'm so glad, in, in a way, I'm so glad that Roxy is a part of the show. Because for once, and especially with Rolaska Talks from her season, season five, and then All Stars 2, it was the same thing. She got she got carried by, even though Alaska tried to act like she wasn't carrying her, bitch, you were. And, you know, I love you, Alaska, but let's call it what it is. And Detox made no qualms about, even though she did try to dance around it, you did carry Roxy all the way to the end. And then at one point, RuPaul had to make it like, okay, sis, like, this is cute, whatever, this is good TV, but sis, you are not winning this show. Like, that's not happening. <laughs> it's like, no, you will be, and then when we make it to the finale, you will be the first girl to get eliminated. So, um, I say all that to say, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to um, this season because now it's going it, to, this is the this season where Roxy is really going to have to prove herself as can she be that that girl without Alaska and Detox being there to carry her? Okay, so now let's get to our final topic and let's talk about Kennedy Davenport is revealing, you know, her beef with Cha. First of all, please hold. Um, I just realized I spelled drama wrong. <laughs> I was like, no, we're not doing that. Hold on, because I was like, Dama? What's Dama? I said, Kenny Davenport, okay, take two. So now let's get to our final topic, and let's talk about this story. You know, we live. We just pretend like the, the fuck-ups don't exist, right? But anyway, so we finally got some tea in regarding um, Kennedy's beef with Trixie Mattel. Now, since the airing of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 3, fans have speculated about a potential feud between top two finalists, Trixie and Kennedy. However, neither of them made it clear over the years if there was any truth to the matter. Now, this week, season 15 finalist Mistress Isabel Brooks shared a new YouTube video that featured Kennedy as a special guest. Mistress, as the agent of chaos she's known to be, decided to paint a Trixie mug on Kennedy, which prompted the dancing diva of Texas to talk about her fellow All-Stars 3 co-star. She said, I was the one with the beef, Kennedy explained. My heart was broken. When I befriended somebody, I really take that to heart. I just felt in the instances of filming All Stars 3, not one time did she tell me she was reading me every chance she got. I really thought that we had created a bond that we weren't able to create during season seven. Kennedy continued by saying, even after the filming, we talked every day. So I was like, all those times we've been talking and bonding and shit, you could have told me you was going to read me all the way to the end. So I was mad. Now, according to Kennedy, the entire cast of All Stars 3 was booked for the same gig together following the All Stars 3 finale. I told her to stay away from me because I was going to fight her. This is what she added. When Mistress asked if Kennedy felt confident that she would whoop Trixie, Kennedy had a simple reply. You already know. Kennedy has then admitted that she did hold on to feelings about Trixie for a long time, despite not being something she enjoys doing. Last year, I called her and we hashed it out, Kennedy recalled. We went back to the way we were. Last but certainly not least, Mistress asked if Kennedy thinks that she beat Trixie in the lip sync for the crown, which she answered with a straight up yeah, and yet Kennedy followed that up with another statement. But I love her. I'm happy for her. I was never bitter that she won. It hasn't stopped nothing here. I lift her up and I praise her and I'm happy for her. She had her moments, but I let it go. So yeah, if you want to check out the whole episode or whatever, you could definitely check it out on YouTube. And um, I like Mistress, but in regards to this whole story, it's like, yeah, Trixie, I think it wasn't just Kennedy she had an issue with. She had an issue with Shangela, too. Remember when, um, who was it? Was it Milk? No, it was um, Thorgy Thor. I think wrote a, a, a paper where she crossed out Shangela's name and Trixie put it on the mirror. And it just so happens, via production, that Shangela saw it. And then they started going at it. She was like, but I put it out of the way for you to not see it. That ain't the point. It's the principle. It's the fact that you're going to put up this thing knowing full on well is direct shade towards me, but you justify it by saying, but I put it out of eyesight so that way you wouldn't see it and it wouldn't hurt your feelings. But bitch, it's going to hurt my feelings. And you know once production get a, um, becomes aware of something, they're going to put it on blast and they're going to put it out there and they're going to, and you know, they, they need the conflict. They need the drama for the TV, for the ratings. 
So um, I'm glad that Kennedy and and Trixie worked it out. And I feel like maybe Trixie's not good at reading the room, even though, yes, she's immensely talented. I love her drag. I like all the things she's been doing, you know, the HDTV show and building the, the hotel and, you know, the music, the country music career that she has and all the other stuff. So I like Trixie as a performer and stuff. But yeah, like I feel like sometimes when it comes to reading the room and valuing your friendships, girl, you need to do a little better. But I'm glad that her and Kennedy worked it out. Everybody can move on. We can now enjoy All Stars 3 as a family. <laughs> Without any itches and all that good stuff. So, okay. So, um, let me read some of these comments. Um, Gabriel Iglesias is another famous Mexican comedian. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like him. Margaret Shaw was the first big female Asian. I remember um, All American Girl. I, that, I used to watch it. See, anytime there was any kind of different representation, I always tried to support it because we needed that representation but then you would always see like um celebrity not celebrity the networks would be so shady towards those shows and we want them to fail that's why i want to give a shout out to mark and delicato if y'all have not seen his his episode of sip and spill with um johnny sibley definitely check it out on um youtube it's funny as hell. Marcus Delacar, he got cute too. Is he look, he older. I can say that now. He grown. <laughs> but um, I loved him when he was on Ugly Betty. He was like the favorite part. He was like my, my favorite part because it seemed a little sassy Latino queen on TV, some we ain't never seen before. I live for it. But he was talking about how like ABC, what they did with the show. It's like nobody wanted to see a show about a a girl, a um, uh, an uh, all-American family or a girl with braces who wasn't attractive and a black woman who ran her own firm, you know, mode with um, Wilhelmina Slater, played by Vanessa Williams, and all the things. Because that show, there was so many things in that show which was seen like completely foreign to racist white people. And I love the fact that he also called out something that I've been saying about for the longest in Hollywood. Hollywood is not interested in making things about women Black people, Latino people, gay people, they're not interested in making that shit. They make it because they have to. They're forced to because the times are changing and they're not trying to change. They're being forced to have to change it, which is why all this woke conversations, all this other crap is coming out. So um, I love the fact that he said that and he spoke about it and he's very, you know, unapologetic in the way he talks. And I just love hearing about him and um, the conversation that him and Johnny was having. I'm looking forward to the whole, the uh, the extra sip and spill part where they really dive into some personal stuff. But yeah, the episode is out. It came out yesterday, I believe. So definitely check that out if you can. So um, that, so that was the point of what I was trying to get when I was talking about like supporting shows about different marginalized communities, people of color and stuff. When are we going to get that first show about, a you know, a sitcom about a gay family? We need that next. Uh, is Dama another FEMA? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it might be. All right. So, yeah. So, um, unless y'all want to drop anything else in the comments before I sign off, we are at the end of our show. So, with that being said, I want to thank you all for tuning in to another brand new episode of Chris Samuel Unfiltered. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. Yeah, I'm going to be pretty busy tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to go work out. I got a double feature at the movies. So, I'm treating myself because I'm like, look, I'm going to be working for the next couple of days. So, I'm like, I want to go see some films. So, I'm going to go, like I told you guys yesterday, as a reminder, I'm going to go see um, Civil War. And then I'm going to go see um, the new Melissa Barrera horror movie, the new Radio Silence Vampire film. Um, Abigail. I'm actually excited to see that film because we need some fun horror movies again. I miss those. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. So I I'm going to go see that. Friday, I'll probably do a show. And then with if anything, I will definitely let you guys I'll give my review on both films. And, you know, since it is going to be opening weekend for Abigail, Civil War came out last week. I'll let you know if definitely those films are something you need to check out. But anyway, before you guys sign off, please do yourselves and myself a solid and hit yourselves you know, as a reminder, hit that like button, that subscribe button, and the notification button so that we can know when, you, when I go live with another future episode of Chris Avalon Unfiltered. Thank you for everybody that was chiming in in the live stream in the comments. Thank you for all of you that are actually watching on social media, especially X, which I'm getting a lot of numbers over there, and Twitch, as well as YouTube. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. And yeah, until next time, ciao, darlings. Bye.